Good afternoon and welcome to our briefing, What's on the Table for the Negotiations? I'm Dan Brissett. I'm the president of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. And today marks the first installment in our briefing series all about what Congress needs to know about COP29. ESI is celebrating 40 years of advancing climate solutions through congressional education. We were founded by a bipartisan group of members of Congress. And since 1984, we've worked to provide science-based information about environmental, energy, and climate change topics to policymakers and the public. We do our best to ensure that our resources are timely, relevant, accessible, and practical. And we put a lot of thought into our resources to always be science-based and ready when congressional staff need that information. What does that look like? Well, sometimes it looks like this, online briefings. Sometimes it looks like in-person briefings, but we do a lot of briefings. We do a lot of other stuff too, we're probably best known for our briefings. Our briefings cover topics like the budget and appropriations process, Inflation Reduction Act and in Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, Progress Report, Carbon Dioxide Removal, Dam Removal, Nature-Based Solutions, and more recently we've started a new series about river community resilience. Everything is always available online at www.eesi.org. Our bi-weekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions, is a great way to stay in the loop and during COP29, there's no better resource out there than our daily newsletter, COP Dispatch. For the past several years, COPtober, as we call it here at EESI, has been a highlight of our annual congressional education programming. What is COPtober? It's more than just a clever portmanteau. Each year at about the same time, the climate policy negotiation, the climate policy negotiators from around the world convene at a two-week conference of parties, or COP held by the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, or UNFCCC. This generally happens in November, which makes October the perfect time to get uh, start getting ready, and hence COPtober. This year, the UN climate negotiations will take place in Baku, Azerbaijan. This will be the 29th Conference of Parties, or COP29. From the opening uh, World Climate Action Summit to the intense negotiations of the conference's final days, thousands of events will take place during the two weeks of COP29. Some members of Congress and their staff will attend in person, most will remain in Washington, and our congressional education programming is specifically designed for them to inform everyone on Capitol Hill and guide policymakers about how to engage in the process effectively. This year, COPtober at EESI will involve three briefings. Today, panelists will preview key issues on the negotiating agenda. Tomorrow, we'll be back at noon Eastern, and our focus will be on methane emissions mitigation. And on Friday, we will study the dynamics of U.S.-China engagement, which will help determine the outcomes and ambition of the negotiations. If you signed up for one of our COP29 briefings, we'll make sure you receive links and summary notes for the entire series to help you prepare for the negotiations and answer tough questions from your boss about what is happening in Baku and why it matters to people back here in the U.S. After the briefings and during the talks, our daily newsletter, COP Dispatch, will be our most essential resource to track developments in Baku. If you work on Capitol Hill, we're also planning some staff-only resources that you really like. On the screen now is a sh uh, link to a survey. Uh, we'll also have this link at the end of the briefing, but if you'd like to take our survey, it means a lot to us. We read every response. If you have any issues with the briefing today or audio problems, video problems, uh, if you have ideas for future coverage of issues, please let us know. Like I said, we read every response and we always appreciate it when people take time. We have amazing panelists uh, lined up, five of them, in fact, and we'll have time for questions after our fifth presenter. You know, because we're entirely online today, the best way you can ask questions is by sending us an email, and the email address to use is ask, that's A-S-K, at EESI.org. You can also tweet us at EESI online. We'll be on social media uh, at EESI online and doing real-time coverage on X. That brings us to our first presenter today. If you've been to past Coptobers, you, I think, will recognize her friendly face. Tracy Bach is a lecturer at the Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth College and a UNFCCC Research and Independent NGOs, or RINGOs, steering committee members. Tracy, thank you so much for joining us once again uh, at our What's on the Table, our, yeah, What's on the Table for the Negotiations uh, briefing. Great to see you. Great to see you too, Dan. Well, thank you for this opportunity. My goal in the next five minutes is to glue together uh, the, the legs of this table and then to set out a couple of placemats on the key issues. So in my first slide, uh, which I don't see up yet, thank you. 
Um, I want to point out a couple of things. Leg number one is that while Dan is correct that we call this COP29, that's shorthand for actually three climate tra treaty meetings that are going on. So you see that in the title, the COP as the 29th meeting of the parties to the framework convention, the CMP 19, 19th meeting to, for the Kyoto Protocol parties, and then very importantly for Baku at COP29, CMA <clears throat> six, which is the sixth meeting of the Paris Agreement parties. I say it's important because the Paris Agreement negotiations in terms of hours of negotiating agenda items uh, is dominant on this agenda. So fundamentally, the second thing I'd like you to take away is when you are either following virtually or attending in person, it's important to know that in this two week COP 29, uh, I'll use the shorthand, the first week is more technical, and that is actually a meeting predominantly of the subsidiary bodies of all three of those treaties, while the second week is much more political. We're up at the plenary level where that quasi-legislative function is going on, where all parties are crafting, hammering out the specific language of decisions that will guide their actions in refining their treaty obligations. So what you see in week one going on are, like I said, technical meetings. Um, I've outlined some of them. There's also different uh, ministerial meetings, but the one really high level is what's become known as the World Climate Action Summit or the World Leader Summit, where heads of states and heads of government will be around at the beginning to set the tone for those technical negotiations and then I'll come back in a resume session in the second week. I'll let you read the details on the slide. There's a lot there, but it's that dichotomy between the first and second week that I think is important to grasp. Second question, second leg or so to understand is this context for the Paris Agreement, because it really is driving the agenda at Baku. So this is a wonderful slide from World Resources Institute. And what it's doing is setting out that the Article 2 goals of the Paris Agreement, which have this quantitative mitigation goal or aim, uh, adaptation and finance goals, which are more qualitatively stated, that they, they are set to be achieved in five-year increments. And these increments are built on three structural pieces of this legal architecture. One, nationally determined contributions, which every party, meaning country, makes that says it's dominated by how much they're going to mitigate over a period of time based on a certain baseline. Second, uh, what's called the Enhanced Transparency Framework. In fact, I remember Andrew's work on that with a representative of China get, developing this uh, after the Paris or as the Paris Agreement was being negotiated. It's called the ETF, and it's a refined uh, reporting system that focuses on regular reporting on progress against those pledges. And then third, and that's individual country progress over those pledges. And then the third part of this ambition cycle or ratchet it's called is the GST, which is called the global stock tick. That just culminated at COP28 last year with a series of recommendations, not only of progress made, but more importantly, gaps still remaining to achieve. And so it's expected at Baku and then finally in Belém when the NDCs, I think they're being called 3.0 now, the revised NDCs are due in by Belen COP30 in 2025, and they are to increase their ambition, um, not just on mitigation, uh, they are to reflect those outcomes in the GST. So it's basically, Baku represents an important time where we're finally through this legal architecture cycle that Paris Agreement uh, set out. A oh, last slide. So what are the key issues, those placemats that my colleagues here on the panel are going to explore in more detail? One, Baku is calling itself COP29 is the finance COP. You'll hear about the NCQG, the new collective quanti quantified goal, which is to replace the 100 billion that was promised without much foundational research uh, back uh, uh, to birth, essentially, the Paris Agreement. NDCs 3.0, which includes the BTRs and the Enhanced Transparency Framework. Whoop, there's my timer. And then finally, I, you cannot let go of the idea that when we're in Eastern Europe and we have developing countries speaking quite strongly about adaptation and loss and damage, those will be key negotiating items that I see will be in different rooms and being part of the mix in coming to 
a consensus on a decision on the key issues on finance and the NDCs. Thanks a lot. I'm looking forward to hearing more detail from the panelists. See, that was great. Uh, awesome presentation as always. Thank you very much. Um, Tracy slides as well as slides from other presenters will be available or actually are already available at www.esi.org. If you select the briefing page, you can download them, check them out. Um, if you'd like to go back and revisit any of the presentations you're about to see or Tracy's, you can also uh, rewatch the um, the webcast at www.esi.org. Uh, and as a reminder, if you have questions, you can send us an email and the email address to use is ask, that's A-S-K at esi.org. Next up is another returning face. Uh, Lynn Wagner is Senior Director for Tracking Progress at the International Institute for Sustainable Development, or IISD. Lynn, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Uh, and so, um, and welcome to the COP. Um, I'll be picking up on a few of the issues that Tracy just introduced. Um, so the Paris Agreement is uh, seen as a bottom-up approach to driving action, as opposed to the Kyoto Protocol, which had this top-down approach. So under the Kyoto Protocol, emission reduction goals amounts were set um, for and Annex 1 countries, the industrialized countries, then had these percentages of cuts that they were supposed to make, and they had to go into their economies and look through and see how they were going to do that. Um, by contrast, the Paris Agreement has this, this enhanced um, transparency framework, and it's this bottom-up kind of pledging where every, every country has to develop and report on its strategy to reduce emissions and take actions. And the progress is really driven through this idea that it's transparent. Um, so every country has to announce its NDC strategy um, every five years. Uh, and then also... Um, beginning um, in December, you have they have to submit uh, biennial reports identifying how well they're doing against that strategy. Um, so it's through this open data it, that the expectation is that trust can be built between the parties because they can clearly see what commitments others are taking and how they're actually implementing those commitments. Uh, so next slide. Um, so the, the nationally determined contributions are the, the first part of this um, process. They de detail a country's climate strategy submitted every five years. Uh, next NDCs are due in February, on February 10th. Um, and so many um, uh, countries might be uh, signaling to each other um, what they might be including in their NDCs, um, what they might need, what kind of support they might need in order to take the commitments um, that other countries hope that they're going to take in their NDCs. Um, rather importantly for the agreement that was reached in Paris itself is that the U.S. and China announced their NDCs uh, before Paris, the year before, um, signaling to each other and the world that they were going to be serious about their commitments um, and, you know, that they were identifying to each other what they were going to do. So um, even though these are due in February, there could be some discussions um, and kind of signaling during COP29. Uh, um, the the um, NDCs are called this ratchet mechanism. So countries are supposed to be increasing their ambition with this new set, this um, NDCs 3.0. Um, next slide. Uh, the way that we'll see whether or not countries are keeping these to these commitments is through the biennial transparency reports. Um, so that this is a complementary component of the transparency mechanism. Um, Countries have to track progress on, um, based on what they've said in their NDCs. And the first submissions of the BTRs are due 31 December of this year. Um, so as I said, this is this new, new mandated report um, outlining what countries are going to take, uh, steps countries are going to take. Um, they are really complementary to the NDCs um, with the NDC stating the the goals, um, the strategy, BTRs providing evidence of how a country is doing and allowing um, others to hold countries accountable, um, see where the challenges are, 
And eventually the information from the BTRs are going to be feeding into the next global stock take because they'll provide this uh, you know, data and evidence of how things are working, how countries are um, taking action to achieve the Paris Agreement. So next slide. Um, so final point is uh, related to what I think will be one of the key issues of COP29. As you heard, this is being called the Finance COP. The um, Paris Agreement said that this COP was supposed to come up with an agreement for uh, what's called the New Collective Quantified Goal on Climate Finance. Uh, so in 2009, the developed countries in Copenhagen had um, come up with this number, 100 billion per year by 2020, that they would provide to developing countries. Uh, as Tracy said, it wasn't based on uh, thorough research about how um, how to measure um, what was needed, um, what was possibly um, generated by developing country, developed countries, um, et cetera. So this is the first time there's a negotiation on the finance goal. Uh, so negotiations have been going on uh, for the last few years. There have already been 11 technical expert dialogues, three meetings of the parties, eight high-level ministerial dialogues, 213 submissions of information, um, a lot going into it. Um, the, you know, what this number will be, how, what it'll turn out to be is, I think, uh, still a question. Um, just one final note. Um, earlier this month, there was a high level ministerial in Baku on this. Uh, and the U.S. suggested, um, the big issue is U.S. suggested that capable countries should join the developed countries in providing funding. So there's this debate about who should be contributing? Is it just developed? Is it some of the the richer um, kind of emerging um, developing countries? Um, and um, also, the U.S. said that um, that this should be done without creating new categories. Um, so there's a big um, uh, kind of um, roadblock in the the UNFCCC where it's you know developed and developing countries have very clear categories, um, and so. When and how this evolution is going to take place um, is, um, you know, it's a it's a much broader question. But within this context, you know, how can they maybe include some um, the, um, contributions from countries with more fun um, uh, funding, like China, um, UAE, Saudi Arabia, um, without changing the categories that they fit in. Um, so, um, we'll, I guess at the end, we'll share information about resources. Hope you'll read the EMB COP coverage um, when you're um, looking for what's happening in Baku. Thanks, Lynn. Uh, Lynn is a great presenter and a, a great friend of ESI and the team at ISD and Earth News Bulletin just does tremendous work. Their newsletters are almost as good as ours, almost. Um, our COP dispatch is really the one if you're going to subscribe to one, but IISD's work is really excellent and really above reproach. So thanks, Lynn. I know it's a busy time. And for all of you for joining us this close to the big, the big event in Baku. That brings us to Jennifer Wang. Jennifer is the Director for International Strategies at the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions. Jennifer, it's always awesome to see you. Thank you for being here today. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Dan, and thanks to EESI for having me, and it's great to be on this panel with these longtime COP friends and colleagues. Um, so I'll speak to one part of the Paris ambition cycle, the global stock take, and then briefly on the mitigation work program. Um, so if we can move to the next slide, thank you. Um, so linked to the enhanced transparency framework and the requirements to have uh, NDCs as set out by Tracy and Lynn, the Paris Agreement has established a global stock take, which is to assess the progress towards the global goals of the Paris Agreement. That first global stock take concluded um, last year at COP28 in Dubai. It was a two-year process. It took a lot of information on how parties are doing across mitigation, adaptation, and means of implementation, which includes finance. Um, and in the end, the outcome contained a number of targets and signals. So some of these signals were mitigation signals, which are mostly contained in paragraph 28 of the GST decision. Um, if you've heard about the tripling of renewable energy capacity globally by 2030, that's one of those signals. Um, there was also a number of adaptation signals that were set out by the decision. 
So what's what's the import of these targets and signals? Um, well, the mandate of the global stock take insists that um, you know parties should work together to enhance international cooperation to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement. It also says that parties should consider the outcome of the global stock take in the new NDCs that are due in February of 2025. So next slide, please. Um, the outcome also included the launch of several global stock take related dialogues and a new short process. So I'll quickly go through those um, to orient everyone. There's something called the NDC dialogue, um, which uh, you can also call the annual GST dialogue, which is meant to facilitate the sharing of lessons learned on how the global stock take outcomes are informing the preparation of parties next NDCs. This workshop already happened in June. Um, it provided a space for parties to kind of reflect on how they were integrating the outcomes of the global stock take in their NDCs and for international organizations and some support mechanisms as well to highlight resources that are available for parties to use. There's something called the UAE Dialogue on Implementing the G Global Stock Take Outcomes. Um, this is intended to start at COP29, uh, but when talking, when parties were talking about how to set up this dialogue in June, um, they diverged on whether the dialogue was a space for implementation of all of the thematic areas of the global stock take or whether um, it should be a financed focused dialogue. So I would ex expect this to continue to be a bit sensitive unless parties have kind of come to a general agreement between June and now. And then there's something um, a process to refine the second global stock take. So the COP28 global stock take outcome called for parties to agree on procedural and logistical elements for the next global stock take based on the, all that experience that they had for the first global stock take. So this includes things like the timing of the different phases, how to transition between the phases, the composition of the high level uh, committee. So parties will need to settle um, areas of disagreement on this. And the next global stock take will take place starting in 2026 and concluding in 2028. Um, so while this new collective quantified goal on climate finance will rightfully claim most of the spotlight in Baku, it's important to remember that um, 2024 has been an important year for progressing on and achieving the targets and signals set out by the global stock take outcome. Um, and also for finding you know, homes to kind of discuss the work and thinking about where that can be discuss and take in stock of and thinking through the next GST process. Um, so for the next slide, please, um, theoretically, the mitigation work program could be one of the places where the mitigation signals from the GST outcome could be discussed. The mitigation work program um, was established in Glasgow in 2021, and the mandate is to urgently scale up mitigation ambition and implementation in this critical decade in a manner, manner that complements the global stock take. Um, so parties have been talking about whether to link this to the GST as well. So this is something that we'll have to, to resolve at COP28. Or sorry, COP29. Ah, COP um, I am running out of time, so I'm just going to wrap up and put a finer point on this uh, moment in the Paris ambition cycle. So we've concluded um, the, the global stock take. We have, you know, important signals to carry forward. Um, we have this moment of truth as to whether this global stock take is successful when we see the new NDCs in February of 2025. So um, we'll learn the collective ambition of parties, where they're going. Um, and if parties don't agree to address the outcomes of the global stock take in specific agenda items, it's even more important to find avenues for international cooperation to kind of take this forward. Um, I might note too then that um, C2ES has recently launched a series of papers that's focused on the kind of leadership that's needed or missing and taking forward some of those targets and signals. And then um, for January of 2025, we will probably have a published um, an, a summary of the COP29 outcome as well. So as it be a useful resource for you. Um, and I'll turn back to Dan, thanks. Thanks, Jennifer. That was a great presentation. We are covering a lot of ground as you probably Sort of heard from some of our panelists. This is actually a this is actually an ongoing process. It doesn't just happen during these two weeks. A lot of work is going on. Uh, we're covering a ton of ground. Uh, if you'd like to go back and revisit any of the panelists' presentations, you can do that by rewatching the live cast or the webcast or by downloading the presentation materials. We'll also eventually have summary notes, uh, which will be also a useful reference for people who want to go back and just skim the content of the briefing. And all of this goes 
for our briefings tomorrow on Global Methane Pledge and on Friday, U.S.-China engagement. Next, we will hear from Ryan Finnegan. Uh, Ryan, welcome back to an ESI COP briefing. Ryan is the manager of policy, strategy, and partnerships at the World Wildlife Fund and helps lead the America is All In Coalition. Ryan, awesome to see you. Looking forward to your presentation. Thanks so much, Dan. Really appreciate the opportunity to be here with everybody um, and uh, really appreciate that I can follow um, three already great panelists that have kind of set uh, the scene and the context for, for COP. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, speak a little bit on uh, U.S. engagement around COP, speaking from a civil society perspective and thinking about the, the strong base of U.S. stakeholders that might be on the ground and engaging at COP. As Dan mentioned, I helped to manage the America's All In Coalition. Um, that's a coalition that has existed um, you know, since shortly after the Paris Agreement came into force um, to reiterate the, the U.S.'s broad spread, uh, widespread support for the Paris Agreement, not only as a commitment made by the national government, but as something that as we really pivot towards implementing these, uh, the international climate uh, negotiations um, is, is taking into account the work that is happening through local governments in the U.S., through the private sector, um, and various other elements of civil society. And so um, many of those stakeholders will be on the ground at COP and have often represented the U.S. or helped to represent the U.S. Um, in these international forums. Um, so why might some of these stakeholders be at COP um, truly helping to influence the, the negotiations um, that have just been laid out kind of like as the key agenda items is a reason why a lot of observers are at COP, um, strengthening relationships um, bilaterally and multilaterally with, with key counterparts is um, an, another key factor for both public sector actors, private sector actors, um, who might be working in specific mitigation or adaptation focus areas. Um, COP is also, you know, as it evolves and as, as what a COP is, kind of like changes bit by bit every year, is also a, a moment on the, the climate calendar in which folks might be making shared and aligned announcements, um, uh, promoting transparency and accountability, um, and, and just building alignment into, into the global climate calendar. Um, and then on the ground, you'll see a variety of um, programming and events, bilateral, multilateral meetings, and then advocacy and activations are kind of like some of the, the ways in which those, those come into fruition. Um, we can go to the next slide, but um, just to dig in on, on some specifics, uh, building off of what has been placed on kind of like the negotiating agenda for COP this year, is a lot of U.S. subnational actors will be thinking about how the U.S. shows up in all of these. So, you know, specific to what is the U.S. NDC, what is achievable, um, and how can that be something that is embraced by all society actors in the U.S. and that there's a, a you know a sense of shared national ownership of our climate targets. Similarly, with how the U.S. is showing up on, on financing and adaptation, um, those are key key elements for a lot of these U.S. stakeholders. Um, specifically to the America's All In Coalition. We've been uh, you know, closely engaged in some of these via our membership and via our close partners um, that have uh, you know, a real stake in, in some of these outcomes. Um, in terms of who folks might see on the ground, I know at least some folks in the audience will be on the ground in Baku as well. Um, uh, the U.S. representation will have uh, representatives from, from tribal nations. Um, we'll have uh, one U.S. governor, dozens of, of state employees. Um, and we're looking at close to, you know, a dozen U.S. mayors and local elected leaders, um, which I think is really interesting. Those uh, those numbers kind of shift depending on what kind of cop it is, um, where if it's, it's like, you know, we're doing a stock take or if there's, you know, maybe in the broader calendar opportunities where it might seem like a more natural fit for some of these local leaders focused on implementation. Um, but I think increasingly every cop is kind of important in the implementation sense. So those are pretty significant numbers. Um, on the local elected side. Um, I don't have a, a, a total count on large uh, on, on businesses, but again, a lot of private sector entities, both um, specific to kind of like climate solutions, but then also broad consumer facing businesses will have representation um, as they work to align some of their sustainable, sustainability efforts with um, kind of the global consensus or, or some of those uh, other elements on, on negotiations, um, variety of NGOs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we will be engaging throughout two weeks of COP. Um, what's shown on the screen right now is the COP presidency's schedule. So uh, 
within this, what is called quote unquote, the action agenda, or like kind of like short term for a lot of the work that is happening outside of the formal negotiations, there is some shape that is given to that via the COP presidency. Um, so some things will be aligned, some things, you know, uh, folks work, you know, based off of uh, schedules and, and and when when it makes sense to, to pull things together. But uh, you'll see in the first week of COP following the World Leaders Summit days, um, there'll be an emphasis on finance, emphasis is on energy and science and technology, uh, youth, health and education going into the second week, food and agriculture. A lot of these cross-cutting issues um, are where folks might be looking to, to plug in. And then I'll uh, I'll wrap pretty quickly, but just to, to plug a little more specifically what we focus in on from the Americas All Inside is we do our best to track as many of the U.S. subnational actors that we are aware of that are coming to COP. That is a huge um, joint effort with a lot of partners. Um, and we, we do our best to, to give some, some shape to that. Um, so we will have some programming um, during the first week of the COP in which we will be speaking to U.S. progress points, connecting U.S. actors with international actors, et cetera. Um, do encourage folks who might be on the ground or who might be tracking the COP from back home to um, to either watch those live streams or to, to join us in the Blue Zone. Um, and then uh, this can maybe be mostly as, as reference for folks following this call, but we are just kind of like one of many of the civil society actors who do have an ongoing presence at COP. And so encourage those of you who are building out schedules and agendas to take a look at some of these other potential resources where you might be able to find um, some really compelling programming. Um, and I think that is more or less it for me. I have a few guides uh, that are linked in the slide deck for folks who might be um, interested in additional follow-up, um, as well as I have my contact information and then contact information from my other colleagues at WWF. We are incredibly interested to, to engage with congressional representatives at COP. I've always appreciated the opportunity to bring those folks together with, with U.S. stakeholders. Thanks, Ryan. That's great. Really appreciate it. Um, definitely take a look at that. The America's All In Pavilion is one of the, the places to be um, in the venue. Uh, lots of amazing events going on there, as, as well as other places, too. We've talked about this being the Conference of Parties. Well, next up, we have a representative of one of the parties, our party, and that is Andrew Rakestra. Uh, Andrew is the Deputy U.S. Head of Delegation to the U.N. Framework Convention on Climate Change and Paris Agreement Negotiations for the U.S. Department of State. Andrew, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate having someone from state on our briefing to, or part of our briefing today. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much. My pleasure. And thanks for the invite to be here. Um, I have the easy task of agreeing with all the panelists before me. Um, I'll briefly start by um, kind of laying out the two sides to the COP um, as we see it, and then um, tick through some of the objectives that we have as the U.S., um, at this COP, so kind of give a, a U.S. perspective on many of the same issues that um, my uh, former panelists spoke to. Um, so as Ryan laid out, you know, we basically see there are kind of two sides to the to the COP here. The first is the formal multilateral negotiations that gets a lot of the um, uh, attention, uh, depending on the issues uh, that are um, being negotiated. And that's, of course, where, as Tracy said, the, the parties to the various international agreements uh, get together and, and, and negotiate. There, I think um, it's perhaps um, underappreciated how much work we have uh, created for ourselves. There's something like 50 plus distinct agenda items uh, and work streams that are ongoing. So that's kind of explains a bit of the chaos of, of COPs. Um, the second half is, uh, again, as Ryan said, the action agenda. And here, this is really where um, non-party stakeholders, uh, governments, the private sector, subnational entities, civil society more generally, showcase their existing efforts, announce new initiatives. Um, really in this process, nothing is negotiated, um, but it uh, really includes a huge number of priority issues. And then often what we'll see is uh, many of the key issues that are taken up in the action agenda then get brought into the formal negotiations in later years. So it's almost a testing ground of sort in some ways to um, on, on certain issues. So from, uh, the uh, U.S. perspective, uh, we're coming into this COP with six different uh, objectives. Three are related to the negotiations. Three are related to non-negotiated outcomes and won't involve formal decisions. So first on, on the negotiations, the first one is uh, mitigation. And Jennifer spoke to this. Um, our objective here is to make sure that 
the significant outcomes from the Dubai COP on the global stock take decision don't fall off the table. So as Jennifer laid out, we had a very good and substantive outcome last year. Uh, and we need here um, in Baku to take that work forward. That's both uh, in the in the process, but also for providing more specificity for what it is that we agreed uh, at COP uh, last year. Um, we characterized the global stock take decision from COP28 as a 1.5 degree roadmap. We need to take that roadmap forward. So that's the first issue. Um, the second issue, uh, which no one has spoken to yet, is uh, Article 6 negotiations. This is relates to um, carbon markets. And there's basically two aspects to this negotiation. The first is the successor to the clean development mechanism under the Kyoto Protocol, basically the ability of countries to host projects that involve emissions reductions, get those projects certified, and then sell them to uh, other countries or uh, the private sector. Um, the other half of Article 6 is emissions trading. Basically, if one party transfers part of their NDC to another party, they don't double count those emissions. Uh, we had major outcomes in Article 6 at previous COPs. Really, we're here, we're wrapping up um, the negotiations, but um, they, they've proven to be quite uh, difficult. But I think we're, we're pretty optimistic that we can finalize them here. The third, of course, uh, uh, is the new collective quantified goal. Here, as others have said, it's the successor to the $100 billion mobilization goal adopted at COP um, at the Copenhagen COP in 2009. Um, so the, the mandate there, uh, we decided to set uh, a new collective quantified goal from a floor of $100 billion per year, taking into account the needs and priorities of developing countries. Um, so it's a collective non-binding goal. The big issues uh, at this top will be uh, the amount, uh, which according to the mandate will be from a floor of 100 billion. But the question is how how much uh, above that floor um, are we going to go? Uh, which parties are expected to contribute, uh, which Lynn had laid out earlier. Um, this, from our view, was an issue that was very clearly and explicitly left open by the mandate from Paris. Um, and then the third issue that will be up for debate is the qualitative elements. So enhancing access to finance, debt sustainability issues. There's a whole category of um, non-quantitative elements as well. So those are the negotiations bits. On the non-negotiations, um, as others have already laid out, uh, our first priority there is uh, focusing on NDCs. As others have said, the NDCs are not due at COP. They're due by February 10th of 2025, but really we see this COP as a key <clears throat> area for bilateral outreach, but also to kind of get the momentum going on the need to follow through with what we agreed at COP last year, that uh, countries in DCs would be 1.5 degree aligned, uh, would it be economy-wide, include all greenhouse gases. So from the US side, we are most focused on those countries that are most consequential to keeping 1.5 degrees within reach, kind of roughly the G20 plus. Um, and in particular, we're focused on uh, China, of course. And China is a 30% uh, emitter, the largest emitter by almost a factor of three. And the actions that they take in the next NBC are um, quite determinative in terms of our ability to keep 1.5 within reach. So the second non-negotiations issue is um, something others have also spoken to, which is the transparency regime. The country's biennial transparency reports are due at the end of, of this year. Um, this uh, um, is something that the Azerbaijan COP presidency has really prioritized. So they're going to be holding quite a number of uh, events related to this and we're, we're quite pleased at that. Um, and then the final non-negotiations issue is the, the action agenda, which, which I spoke to at the, at the beginning, it's the greater metropolitan COP. Um, from the US side, we will be uh, focused on methane and non-CO2 gases. We hosted a, a non-CO2 super pollutant summit this summer. We'll be hosting another one at this top. Um, there, we're also focused on um, putting some meat in the bones on the doubling, the tripling renewable energy and doubling energy efficiency through, for example, declarations on energy storage. Um, and also focused on forestry um, issues as, as well. 
I'll go ahead and, and stop that. Thanks so much. Thanks, Andrew. That was a great presentation. I'm just imagining somewhere on February 10th, there's like a, you know, a UNF triple C email account that's going to start getting, you know, NDC at, you know, us.gov. Uh, like, you know, Tracy, you're a professor. I'm sure that's how you get lots of assignments. And certainly when we have deadlines, that's how it goes. But um, uh, that's uh, a great presentation. And again, if you'd like, if anyone in our audience would like to go back uh, and revisit this, it's everything's available on our website. And then tomorrow we'll be doing a deeper dive on methane. Uh, and on on Friday, we'll be doing a deeper dive on U.S.-China engagement. That brings us to our questions and answers period. Um, we are collecting uh, email or questions from our online audience, and they're starting to come in. So thank you very much for that. Um, but as we get or, or before we get to them, I'd like to start, Tracy. I'd like to go back to you uh, and ask a question. You know, is there something, a topic, an issue that you expect will get more attention relatively at COP twenty nine than maybe? in prior years, or is there something that just hasn't come up yet that you would like, that you expect to be part of the agenda that you would like to mention? Yeah, well, we tend to be so mitigation and finance focused, and I think we've addressed that really thoroughly. Um, I think the loss and damage fund, uh, and even though there have been breakthroughs in there and the pledging is going on, that's gonna be an important one to watch as it is, its progress is traded off with other rooms on those other mitigation and finance issues. Um, uh, Lynn, from you, anything that you expect to be maybe a little bit more attention grabbing this year than others? Um, I guess not so much from agenda wise, but I think leadership wise, there'll be a lot of eyes on, I guess the US. So John Kerry just retired at the end of the last COP. Um, and now John Podesta would be leading the delegation. Um, and John Kerry's relationship with China was so essential. Um, and so how how is that going fit to fit in? And then also Brazil's hosting the next COP, um, which is seen as that's when all the NDCs are going to come in. Um, and, and Brazil was the G20 host this year, and they're kind of tying it together. So just how how is that going to play out and what will Brazil be kind of signaling uh, for for what's going to happen next year? Uh, Jennifer? Yeah, so thinking again about the agenda, and these aren't necessarily things that will get more attention other than more than they're they're new. Um, but speaking to adaptation, there's a decision expected for transformational adaptation. So that's a very new concept that parties, well, not necessarily a new concept, but it's new that parties are beginning to grapple and trying to define this. Um, and there are linkages to just transition and equity concepts. So that'll be interesting to see how that um, goes through. And then maybe uh, just transition, which is a really, uh, is a fairly like new formal discussion under the UNFCCC. So um, a cross-cutting issue and may have linkages to the global stock take as well. So those are two things that we'll be looking at. Thanks. Ryan, over to you. Yeah, I, I think I'd, I'd reiterate some of what, um, well, as Lynn mentioned, uh, I think U.S. leadership Certainly uh, the context of when the COP is happening is going to have a lot of eyes on the COP for folks um, and how the U.S. is is, is showing up. Um, I also think the U.S.-China relationship is really interesting and will be interesting to see continue to develop um, at and around COP. Glad that there's also a briefing um, that, that's going into the weeds um, on, on U.S. and China. Um, and maybe one other thing that I'll mention um, with a bit more of my WWF hat on uh, is uh, right now uh, uh, there's a COP on uh, biodiversity that is kicking off in Colombia, and I think connecting the linkages between biodiversity work and nature work, and and climate is another kind of increasing uh, feature and focus um, and interesting to. I'll be keeping an eye on um, any connectivity that we see there. And Andrew, I'll give you the last word. You can choose to answer my questions, or you can just add anything else that you would like based on what your co-panelists had to say. Sure. I'm. Um, I'll say. I mean, I think the NDCs that do come forward ahead of COP um, will be uh, really influential and set the tone for the NDCs that that follow it. So I think that's going to be something that many people are paying attention to. I'll also add um, an issue that no one has spoken about, which is the gender negotiations. So this is an issue that uh, has, has become uh, very prominent, both in the negotiations, but also in the implementation of climate action, recognizing that it must be gender responsive. So that's that's a real priority issue from, from the U.S. perspective that we focus on as well. 
Awesome. Thank you for that. I'm glad you mentioned that. That's typically one of like the thematic days as well, where that's a big emphasis of, of, of different events happening. Um, we got a really great question from someone in our online audience. And Andrew, maybe it makes sense to start with you. You might be able to comment on this one, but we'll open it up to everyone. And I'm going to I'm gonna read it sort of as it's been written. Um, why does it matter that Article 6 be finalized? Countries are already exchanging credits or internationally transferred mitigation outcomes. So what are the actual real world impacts of clarifying the rules around the mechanism? That's, I mean, that's a good point. In terms of the actual emissions trading bit of it, that's true. It's already operating in practice. And I think from the U.S. perspective, we don't see uh, any of the decisions that we're taking at COP29 as uh, necessary for the functioning of the system that we've already set up. I think from our side, from our perspective, we're just trying to wrap everything up and provide that certainty to the market and to parties that the rules uh, will remain consistent uh, throughout le at least this first uh, up period and allow the, the authorizations of countries to move forward and for this to start to happen. On the 6.4 mechanism, uh, that is an area where uh, we, the, 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 this, there's a supervisory body that has done an enormous amount of work developing the methodologies on the types of um, projects that can get credited. That's an area that's not yet in, uh, functional. And I think we're optimistic that um, if parties uh, are in agreement, which we, you know, which we think they should be, uh, we should be able to get this work to, um, to get started in 2025. Um, other panelists, any comments around sort of the status of Article 6 and its importance for finalization? Okay. Um, all right. Well, we'll move on because we got another really great question from the audience. Um, I don't know who will start with this one. So I'll just, we'll have it be a free for all. Everyone will have a chance. Um, I'm going to again, read it so that I don't get it wrong. This COP will help try, this COP will try to help align NDCs and other aspects of the global climate effort with the 1.5 degrees Celsius limit. What does such alignment actually mean in practice and what can be done about it at this COP? Tracy, it looked like you might be unmuting, so I'm happy to start with you. And I put my my fists up when we said we're gonna. Your dukes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think just a couple of things. So one, we know that we have a special report on 1.5C out of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And that actually happened after that quantitative goal was included in the Paris Agreement. Uh, but it pointed out substantively the differences that we will experience between a 2C and a 1.5C world. So having the focus of NDC 3.0 in aligning with that is critical. And what this COP could do then is actually um, drive the review of individual NDCs. And of course, non uh, nonprofits like Climate Action Track Tracker will do that in their work and publicize that. But the key thing will be connecting um, pledges for the next mitigation cycle, essentially qualifying them or um, characterizing them as 1.5 degree compliant and showing what particular national policies and strategies will do to actually achieve that. So it's basically getting us to focus on a more limited carbon budget and how we're using it. Thank you, Tracy. Um, other panelists, Lynn, Jennifer, Ryan, Andrew, any other things else you'd like to add? I could uh, just come back to the, the fact that this is the finance COP. Um, so there are a number of countries that have really limited fiscal space to, to take action. Um, and so if they, but they probably could do a lot to, to address emissions. Um, and so if they can, you know, if that can be sorted out and if they can um, see that there's going to be funding coming forward, then they would probably be able to pledge uh, greater action. And then oh, also, Andrew. Oh, uh, go ahead, Jennifer, and then we'll go to Andrew. Sure. Um, sort of building on something I mentioned earlier, but there was a, a strong uh, effort throughout this year to promote all of the things that that parties have available to help them do their NDCs. So, the, um, the UN Secretary General was promoting, you know, unifying or getting the entire UN system together to be able to help parties with their NDCs. The Troika has had a strong focus on having parties be helped in, in de delivering on their NDCs. And um, it's pointing out that there's, you know, 
some practice now that has, you know, we've had a couple iterations of NDCs at this point, and we have um, norms being developed. We have the GST signals and targets that have come out. So it's it's kind of highlighting all of these things at COP. We will also have um, a new NDC synthesis report probably shortly before COP so that we'll be able to see where things stand. Um, and then it's kind of using the COP to be able to figure out where and whether parties can talk about, you know, talk about these things in different spaces in the agenda and, and outside. Uh, Andrew. I mean, I think um, the scientific answer, I guess, was, was kind of answered by the IPCC, which is basically that in order to limit warming to 1.5, we collectively uh, meaning, you know, every country in the world need to reduce emissions by 43% by 2030, 60% by 2035 and to net zero by 2050. Um, of course, it becomes much more difficult when we're talking about individual nationally determined contributions towards that effort. Uh, and that's where uh, the key issues that Lynn was talking about support come in uh, and providing the, the signals that are needed to encourage countries to put forward the most ambitious NDCs that they can. Uh, we think that signal came very clearly from the last global stock take because it you know, explicitly asked all countries to put forward 1.5 degree aligned NDCs. And really, when you have about 20 countries representing uh, around 80% of global emissions, it's a pretty small group of countries that, that matter most for keeping 1.5 degrees within reach. And those are the countries that we as the U.S. at least are most focused on. Uh, Ryan, I don't want you to feel left out. If you have anything you'd like to contribute, please feel free. No, I just, just want a lot of what folks are saying. Um, there's obviously, I think, uh, a scientific understanding of what we need to do to to hold warming to, to 1.5 degrees. As Jen was mentioning, some of like the how countries can be enhancing their NDCs. What also came to mind for me is is thinking about how countries are really integrating both their domestic financing streams and then also the capacities of their localities into their NDC planning um, and their 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 pathways development. And so that is something that we've seen progress on too since COP28 um, is a, you know, a large number of countries um, committing to really integrating their, those localities into their NDC design. Um, and that'll help countries in, in setting more ambitious targets. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to ask, so we, this is a, a big deal. It'll be tens of thousands of people there, presumably lots of different stuff. These are incredibly complicated negotiations. Um, we're fortunate that we have five people who <laughs> know this stuff inside and out. Do you have any suggestions for resources, cheat sheets um, that congressional staff in particular can keep an eye on during COP? We've already, Lynn's organization does an amazing job. We do an amazing job. I know the State Department does a great newsletter every day. But other than that, are there any other suggestions that any panelists have for people who want to you know, track things as closely as they can from a congressional perspective back here in the States. And Tracy, I'm happy to go back to you. You were, you were nodding, but you don't have to go back to you if I don't, if you don't want me to. Ah, the auctioneering school of running a classroom. You nod, you get called on. Okay. So um, right away, I think of an organization that's near and dear to my heart, Ringo Research and Independent NGO Constituency, especially for those folks who are going to their first COP and are trying to navigate it. We hold a webinar. And so you can find that if you get, uh, Google Ringo and UNFCCC, you'll land on our website. There's great preparatory webinars so that you can understand what's going on. And tomorrow, no, yeah, Thursday, no, tomorrow, there will be um, one on the top issues of COP29 with our experts. I also um, just got off a World Resources Institute WRI um, webinar this morning on climate financing in particular, and looking at the private side and the mobilizing side. And I would highly recommend their briefings. And then finally, I tend to uh, follow Carbon Brief quite a bit. I don't know if that really translates back to uh, as well uh, to uh, you know congressional um, needs, but in terms of understanding the COP critically, when I marry that with Lynn's ENB, um, I really feel like I, I, I I've got the the full scoop on what happened, and then I can try to translate it back to the domestic environment. So those are some resources I recommend. That's great. Um, any other plugs for resources that you all find especially essential? Go ahead, Andrew. I'll just say, I mean, the State Department has, of course, an enormous comms effort uh, that, uh, as well. Um, for any congressional staffers who are uh, watching, 
uh, feel free to, of course, to reach out to Julia Greensfelder, who I'm sure you know in, uh, in our office, who uh, is more than happy to answer any specific questions that you might have uh, from that perspective. And then, Go ahead, Jennifer. Yeah, um, so I think I'll double check with my team. I think if you sign up for our newsletter, you should be able to sign up for some quick daily updates from COP. Um, we also offer a summary at the end, but yeah, highly recommend ISD and Carbon Brief. Um, but if you also want to just kind of get what's the big highlight for the day, maybe Climate Home News is a good way to kind of get, you know, what's what's the biggest headline for COP for that, that day or two, so. Ryan? Um, yeah, I, I'm in agreement again with a lot of what folks have already said. Um, I have a few resources in my in my slides that uh, I would, would folk, point folks to, including a few guidebooks that have been put out that might be helpful for folks that might be planning on, on logistics. And then I want to confirm, but the SEC, the Global Strategic Communications Council, I think some folks there put, put out um, some really good cop briefers too. Um, so I'm checking if that's going to be a daily newsletter, but those are folks who I've, I've turned to many, on many occasions as we, we track the negotiations. And Lynn, we've referenced Earth News Bulletin a couple more times. Is there anything else you'd like to say about that amazing resource? Uh, just, yeah, that uh, we come out each day with a short summary as well as photos of the participants. Um, and so that, you know, helps you know who's there representing which country and, um, you know, who's talking to whom and um, and if they've moved all into contact groups or if it's still the plenary, just gives you kind of an overview of what stage the negotiation is in. That's great advice. Thank you very much. Um, we are just about at time. Uh, this was a tremendous panel. Thank you, Tracy, Lynn, Jennifer, Ryan, and Andrew for making time to join us today. Uh, we had a really robust online audience I saw lots of House and Senate servers popping up in our in our reports. So thanks to everyone in our online audience for joining us. Um, but thank you for the tremendous panels um, um, and really looking forward to um, tomorrow uh, as well and Friday. Um, I am just one person at ESI. I'd like to thank all the people who actually pulled this off, uh, including Dan O'Brien, Omri, Allison. Big thanks to Anna. Anna and I will actually be at, in COP for both weeks. So uh, if you're there, look us up. Uh, thanks to Anna. Thanks to Molly, Nicole. We have three amazing interns, Jemiah, Josh, and uh, Alia, uh, who also help with everything. You can't see him in the background of the of the of the platform we're using, but videographer Troy is lurking. I assure you. Uh, and since Andrew um, mentioned her, I'd like to just say thanks to Julia as well um, for all of her efforts. Uh, she's been a great um, great colleague or great partner uh, when she was back on the Senate side and. And now it's state. So thanks to her and thanks to the U.S. Center and all of the people who are pulling this off. Um, we had an amazing effort to watch uh, unfold in real time. And of course, we wish them all the best of luck uh, for good outcomes. Our extensive coverage of the U.N. Uh, climate negotiations continues tomorrow. I've mentioned this a few times. Tomorrow is methane mitigation on the global stage. And on Friday, we have U.S., China, engagement, and international climate diplomacy. Uh, you can sign up for those if you haven't yet by visiting us online at www.esi.org. When you're there, sign up for Climate Change Solutions, our biweekly newsletter. Also, sign up for COP Dispatch. That's our daily newsletter. It'll also have links to our trackers for announcements, reports, U.S. officials who are participating, and uh, coverage of uh, all of the goings-on or as much of the goings-on as we can manage from a congressional perspective. So definitely sign up for that. Um, Troy will put up the survey slide one last time. If anyone has any comments or feedback that they'd like to share with us, please go ahead and do that. It, like I said, always means a lot. We love to get responses and, and feedback about how things will go. We will wrap up. I will see everyone back here. Well, not our panelists. Hopefully you probably have other things to do, although you're all welcome. But everyone in our audience, hope to see you 23 hours from now, tomorrow at noon Eastern for uh, methane mitigation on the global stage. And I wish everyone a great Wednesday afternoon. Uh, thanks so much. See you next time.